Section 4 of Anecdotes of Dogs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Jackson. Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse. Introduction, Part 4. The following striking anecdote of a similar kind appeared in the first number of the new issue of Cassell's Illustrated Family Paper. After giving a short account of a fire escape man named Samuel Wood, the writer thus alludes to his dog Bill. As to Bill, he regards him evidently in the light of a friend. He had him when he was a pup from a poor fellow who died in the service, and he and his Bill have been on excellent terms ever since. The fire escape man's dog takes after his master in courage and perseverance. He is of the terrier breed, six years old. An alarm of fire calls forth all his energy. He is the first to know that something is wrong, the first to exert himself in setting it right. He has not been trained to the work. It is a gift, as his master says. And if we all used our gifts as efficiently as the dog Bill, it would be better for us. On an alarm of fire, Bill barks his loudest, dashes about in a frantic manner, till his master and the escape are on their way to it. He, of course, is there first. Giving the police and the crowd to understand that Wood and his fire escape are coming. When the escape is fixed and Wood begins to ascend the ladder, Bill runs up the canvas. As soon as a window is opened, Bill leaps in and dashes about to find the occupants. Loudly barking for assistance as soon as he has accomplished his errand of mercy. His watchfulness and sagacity are never at fault, although on more than one occasion he has stood a fair chance of losing his life and has sustained very severe injury. Not long ago a collar was presented to Bill as a reward for his services. Unfortunately for him, he has since lost this token of public regard, a misfortune much to be regretted. The following verse was engraved on the collar. I am the fire escape man's dog. My name is Bill. When fire is called, I am never still. I bark for my master, all danger brave to bring the escape, human life to save. Collared or collarless, Bill is always ready to lend a helping bark. May his life be long and his services properly esteemed. The following anecdote shows extraordinary sense, if not reasoning faculty in a dog. A lady of high rank has a sort of collie or scotch sheepdog. When he is ordered to ring the bell, he does so. But if he is told to ring the bell when the servant is in the room whose duty it is to attend, he refuses, and then the following occurrence takes place. His mistress says, Ring the bell, dog. The dog looks at the servant, and then barks his bow-wow once or twice. The order is repeated two or three times. At last the dog lays hold of the servant's coat in a significant manner, just as if he had said to him, don't you hear that I am to ring the bell for you? Come to my lady. His mistress always had her shoes warmed before she put them on, but one day during the hot weather her maid was putting them on without their having been previously placed before the fire. When the dog saw this he immediately interfered, expressing the greatest indignation at the maid's negligence. He took the shoes from her, carried them to the fire, and after they had been warmed as usual, he brought them back to his mistress with much apparent satisfaction, evidently intending to say, if he could, it is all right now. The dispositions and characters of dogs, as well as their intelligence, vary very much. Let me give a few instances of this. When that benevolent man, Mr. Backhouse, went to Australia in hopes of doing good among the convicts, he was residing in the house of a gentleman who had a son about four years of age. This boy strayed one morning into the bush and could not be found after a long search had been made for him. In the evening a little dog which had accompanied the child scratched at the door, and on its being opened showed unmistakable signs of wishing to be followed. This was done, and he led the way to the child, who was at last found sitting by the side of a river three or four miles from the house. At Albany, in Worcestershire, at the seat of Admiral Mailing, a dog went every day to meet the mail, and brought the bag in his mouth to the house. The distance was about a half a quarter of a mile. The dog usually received a meal of meat as his reward. 
the servants having on one day only neglected to give him his accustomed meal the dog on the arrival of the next mail buried the bag nor was it found without considerable search m diobensville had a dog which he had brought up in india from two months old and having to go with a friend from pondicherry to bangalore a distance of more than nine hundred miles he took the animal along with him our journey says m d o occupied nearly three weeks and we had to traverse plains and mountains and to ford rivers and go along by-paths the animal which had certainly never been in that country before lost us at bengalore and immediately returned to pondicherry he went directly to the house of my friend m beglier then commandant of artillery and with whom i had generally lived now the difficulty is not so much to know how the dog subsisted on the road for he was very strong and able to procure himself food but how he should so well have found his way after an interval of more than a month this was an effort of memory greatly superior to that which the human race is capable of exerting a gentleman residing in denmark mr de quick one of the king's privy councillors found that he had a remarkable dog it was the habit of mr de quick to leave copenhagen on fridays for drovengord his country seat if he did not arrive there on friday evening the dog would invariably be found at copenhagen on saturday morning in search of his master hydrophobia becoming common all dogs were shot that were found running about an exception being made in the case of mr de quick's dog on account of his sagacity and fidelity a distinctive mark being placed upon him the following anecdotes are from daniel's rural sports upon the fidelity of dogs the following facts deserve to be here recorded of this property or other peculiar traits if they appertain to any class of sporting dogs in that class they will be noticed dr Beatty, in one of his ingenious and elegant essays relates a story in his own knowledge of a gentleman's life being saved who fell beneath the ice by going in quest of assistance and almost forcibly dragging a farmer to the spot mr valiant describes the losing of a bitch while travelling in africa when after firing his gun and fruitlessly searching for her he dispatched one of his attendants to return by the way they had proceeded when she was found at about two leagues distance seated by the side of a chair and basket which had dropped unperceived from his wagon an instance of attentive fidelity which must have proved fatal to the animal either from hunger or beasts of prey had she not been luckily discovered as instances of the dog's sagacity the following are submitted in crossing the mountain st gothard near airola the chevalier gaspard de brandenburg and his servant were buried by an avalanche his dog who escaped the heap of snow did not quit the place where he had lost his master this was fortunately not far from the convent the animal howled ran to the convent frequently and then returned struck by his perseverance the next morning the people from the house followed him he led them directly to the spot scratched the snow and after thirty-six hours passed beneath it the chevalier and his domestic were taken out safe hearing distinctly during their confinement the howling of the dog and the discourse of their deliverers sensible that to the sagacity and fondness of this creature he owed his life the gentleman ordered by his will that he should be represented on his tomb with his dog and at zug in the church of st oswald where he was buried in seventeen twenty eight they still show the monument and the effigy of this gentleman with the dog lying at his feet in seventeen ninety two a gentleman who lived in varay street clare market went with his family to the pit of drury lane theatre at about half past five in the evening leaving a small spaniel of king charles's breed locked up in the dining room to prevent the dog from being lost in his absence at eight o'clock his son opened the door and the dog immediately went to the playhouse and found out his master though the pit was unusually thronged and his master seated near its centre a large dog of mr hilson's of maxwell hugh on the twenty first of october seventeen ninety seven seeing a small one that was following a cart from kelso carried by the current of the tweed in spite of all of its efforts to bear up against the stream after watching its motions attentively plunged voluntarily into the river and seizing the tired animal by the neck 
brought it safely to land. The docility of the dog is such that he may be taught to practice with considerable dexterity a variety of human actions, to open a door fastened by a latch, and pull a bell when desirous to be admitted. Faber mentions one belonging to a nobleman of the Medici family, which always attended at its master's table, took from him his plates, and brought him others, carried wine to him in a glass upon a salver, which it held in its mouth, without spilling. The same dog would also hold the stirrup in its teeth while its master was mounting his horse. Mr. Daniel had formerly a spaniel, which he gave the Honorable Mr. Greville, that, beyond the common tricks which dogs trained to fetch and carry exhibit, would bring the bottles of wine from the corner of the room to the table by the neck, with such care as never to break one, and, in fact, was the boots of the mess-room. Some few years since, the person who lived at the Turnpike House, about a mile from Stratford-upon-Avon, had trained a dog to go to the town for any small parcels of grocery, etc., which he wanted. A note, mentioning the things required, was tied round his neck, and in the same manner the articles were fastened and arrived safe to his master. Colonel Hutchinson relates the following anecdote. A cousin of one of my brother officers was taking a walk at Tunbridge Wells, when the strange Newfoundland snatched her parasol from her hand and carried it off. The lady followed the dog who kept ahead, constantly looking back to see if she followed. The lady followed the dog who kept ahead, constantly looking back to see if she followed. The dog at length stopped at a confectioner's and went in, followed by the lady, who as the dog would not resign it, applied to the shopman for assistance. He then told her that it was an old trick of the dog's to get a bun, and that if she would give him one, he would return the property. She cheerfully did so, and the dog as willingly made the exchange. The above anecdote proves that dogs are no mean observers of countenances, and that he had satisfied himself by a previous scrutiny as to the probability of his delinquencies being forgiven. Of the abstinence and escape of a dog, the following narrative may not be uninteresting. In 1789, when preparations were making at St. Paul's for the reception of His Majesty, a favorite dog followed its master up the dark stairs of the dome. Here, all at once, it was missing, and calling and whistling were to no purpose. Nine weeks after this, all but two days, some glaziers were at work in the cathedral and heard a faint noise amongst the timbers which support the dome. Thinking it might be some unfortunate human being, they tied a rope round a boy and let him down near the place whence the sound came. At the bottom he found a dog lying on its side, the skeleton of another dog, and an old shoe half eaten. The humanity of the boy led him to rescue the animal from its miserable situation, and it was accordingly drawn up. Much emaciated, and scarce able to stand, the workmen placed it in the porch of the church to die or live as it might happen. This was about ten o'clock in the morning. Some time after, the dog was seen endeavouring to cross the street at the top of Ludgate Hill, but its weakness was so great that, unsupported by a wall, it could not accomplish it. The miserable appearance of the dog again excited the compassion of a boy who carried it over. By the aid of the houses it was enabled to get to Fleet Market, and over two or three narrow crossings in its way to Holborn Bridge, and about eight o'clock in the evening it reached its master's house in Red Lion Street, Holborn, and laid itself down on the steps, having been ten hours in its journey from St. Paul's to that place. The dog was so much altered, its eyes being so sunk in its head as to be scarce discernible, that the master would not encourage his faithful old companion, who when lost was supposed to weigh twenty pounds, but now only weighed three pounds, fourteen ounces. The first indication it gave of knowing its master was by wagging its tail when he mentioned its name, Phyllis. For a long time it was unable to eat or drink, and it was kept alive by the sustenance it received from its mistress, who used to feed it with a teaspoon. At length it recovered. It must not be supposed that this animal existed for nine weeks without food. She was in whelp when lost, and doubtless ate her young. The remains of another dog killed by a similar fall were likewise found, and were most probably converted by the survivor to the most urgent of all natural purposes and when this treat was done 
the shoe succeeded, which was almost half devoured. What famine and a thousand accidents could not do was effected a short time after by the wheels of a coach, which unfortunately went over her and ended the life of poor Phyllis. Of dogs that have supported themselves in a wild state to the great loss and annoyance of the farmer, there are two instances worthy of notice, from the cunning with which both these dogs frustrated for a length of time every secret and open attack. In December 1784, a dog was left by a smuggling vessel near Boomer on the coast of Northumberland. Finding himself deserted, he began to worry sheep, and did so much damage that he was the terror of the country, within the circuit of above twenty miles. It is asserted that when he caught a sheep, he bit a hole in its right side, and after eating the fat about the kidneys, left it. Several of them, thus lacerated, were found alive by the shepherds, and being properly taken care of, some of them recovered, and afterwards had lambs. From this delicacy of his feeding, the destruction may in some measure be conceived, as the fat of one sheep in a day would scarcely satisfy his hunger. Various were the means used to destroy him. Frequently was he pursued with hounds, greyhounds, etc., but when the dogs came up with him, he laid down on his back, as if supplicating for mercy, and in that position they never hurt him. He therefore laid quietly, taking his rest, until the hunters approached, when he made off, without being followed by the hounds, until they were again excited to the pursuit, which always terminated unsuccessfully. He was one day pursued from Howick to upwards of thirty miles distance, but returned thither and killed sheep the same evening. His constant residence was upon a rock on the Hugh Hill, near Howick, where he had a view of four roads that approached it, and there... In March 1785, after many fruitless attempts, he was, at last, shot. Another wild dog, which had committed similar devastation among the sheep, near Wooler, in the same county, Northumberland, was on the 6th of June 1799 advertised to be hunted on the Wednesday following by three packs of hounds, which were to meet at different places. The aid of men and firearms was also requested, with a reward promised of twenty guineas to the person killing him. This dog was described by those who had seen him at a distance as a large greyhound, with some white in his face, neck, and one foreleg white, rather grey on the back, and the rest of a jet black. An immense concourse of people assembled at the time appointed, but the chase was unprosperous for he eluded his pursuers among the Cheviot hills, and, what is singular, returned that same night to the place from whence he had been hunted in the morning, and worried and knew and her lamb. During the whole summer he continued to destroy the sheep, but changed his quarters, for he infested the fells sixteen miles south of Carlisle, where upwards of sixty sheep fell victims to his ferocity. In September, Hounds and firearms were again employed against him, and after a run from Carrick Fell, which was computed to be thirty miles, he was shot whilst the hounds were in pursuit by Mr. Sewell of Wedlock, who laid in ambush at Mossdale. During the chase, which occupied six hours, he frequently turned upon the headmost hounds and wounded several so badly as to disable them. Upon examination, he appeared of the Newfoundland breed, of a common size, wire-haired, and extremely lean. This description does not tally with a dog so injurious to the farmers in Northumberland, although, from circumstances, there is little doubt but it was the same animal. With a laughably philosophical account of dogs under the supposition of a transmigration of souls, and with their general natural history from Linnaeus and Buffon, this introductory chapter will be concluded. A facetious believer in the art of distinguishing at the sight of any creature from what class of animals his soul is derived, thus allots them. The souls of deceased bailiffs and common constables are in the bodies of setting dogs and pointers. The terriers are inhabited by trading justices. The bloodhounds were formerly a set of informers, thief-takers, and false evidences. The spaniels were heretofore courtiers, hangers-on of administrations and hack journal writers, all of whom preserve their primitive qualities of fawning on their feeders, licking their hands, and snarling and snapping at all who offer to offend their master. A former train of gamblers and blacklegs are now embodied in that species of dog called lurchers. 
bulldogs and mastiffs were once butchers and drovers greyhounds and hounds owe their animation to country squires and fox hunters little whiffling useless lapdogs draw their existence from the quandambo macaronis and gentlemen of the tippy still being the playthings of ladies and used for their diversion there are also a set of sad dogs derived from attorneys and puppies who were in past time attorneys clerks shopmen to retail haberdashers men milliners etc etc turnspits are animated by old aldermen who still enjoy the smell of roast meat that droning snarling species styled dutch pugs have been fellows of colleges and that faithful useful tribe of shepherd's dogs were in days of yore members of parliament who guarded the flock and protected the sheep from wolves and thieves although indeed of late some have turned sheep biters and worried those they ought to have defended linnaeus informs us the dog eats flesh and farinaceous vegetables but not greens this is a mistake for they will eat greens when boiled its stomach digests bones it uses the tops of grass as a vomit, is fond of rolling and carrion, voids its excrements on a stone, its dung, the album grisum, is one of the greatest encouragers of putrefaction, it laps up its drink with its tongue, makes water sideways by lifting up one of its hind legs, is most diuretic in the company of a strange dog, and very apt to repeat it where another dog has done the same odorat anum alterius menstruans catulit cum various mordet illa illos coherit copula junctus its scent is most exquisite when its nose is moist it treads lightly on its toes scarce ever sweats but when hot lolls out its tongue generally walks frequently round the place it intends to lie down on its sense of hearing is very quick when asleep it dreams it goes with young sixty-three days and commonly brings from four to ten the male puppies resemble the dog the female the bitch an assertion by no means accurate any more than the tail always bending to the left is a common character of the species it is the most faithful of animals it is very docile fawns at his master's approach runs before him on a journey often passing over the same ground on coming to crossways stops and looks back drives cattle home from the field keeps herds and flocks within bounds protects them from wild beasts points out to the sportsman the game brings the birds that are shot to its master will turn a spit at brussels and in holland draws little carts to the herb market in more northern regions draws sledges with provisions travellers etc will find out what is dropped watchful by night and when the charge of a house or garden is at such times committed to him his boldness increases and he sometimes becomes perfectly ferocious when it has been guilty of a theft slinks away with its tail between its legs eats voraciously with oblique eyes enemy to beggars attacks strangers without provocation hates strange dogs howls at certain notes in music and often urines on hearing them will snap at a stone thrown at it is sick at the approach of bad weather a remark vague and uncertain is afflicted with worms, spreads its madness, grows blind with age, sapi gonorrhea infectus, driven as unclean from the houses of the Mahometans, yet the same people establish hospitals for and allow them daily food. The dog, says Buffon, like every other animal which produces above one or two at a time, is not perfectly formed immediately after birth. Dogs are always brought forth blind, the two eyelids are not simply glued together, but shut up with a membrane, which is torn off as soon as the muscles of the upper eyelids acquire strength sufficient to overcome this obstacle to vision, which generally happens the tenth or twelfth day. At this period, the bones of the head are not completed, the body and muzzle are bloated, and the whole figure is ill-defined. But in less than two months, they learn to use all their senses. Their growth is rapid, and they soon gain strength. In the fourth month, they lose some of their teeth which as in other animals are soon replaced and never again fall out they have six cutting and two canine teeth in each jaw and fourteen grinders in the upper and twelve in the under making in all forty-two teeth but the number of grinders sometimes varies in particular dogs 
The time of gestation is nine weeks, or sixty-three days, sometimes sixty-two or sixty-one, but never less than sixty. The bitch produces six, seven, and even so far as twelve puppies, and generally has more at the subsequent litters than she has at the first. But the observation of Buffin, that a female hound, covered by a dog of her own kind, and carefully shut up from all others, has been known to produce a mixed race, consisting of hounds and terriers, is totally void of foundation. A curious circumstance in the account of the setter will be mentioned, of an impression made upon the mind of a bitch, of that sort by the attention of a cur, which never had access to her, and yet her whelps were always like him, and possibly this hound bitch had a violent hankering after some terrier. Dogs continue to propagate during life, which is commonly limited to fourteen or fifteen years, yet some have been known to exceed twenty, but that is rare. The duration of life in this, as in other animals, bears proportion to the time of his growth, which in the dog is not completed in less than two years, and he generally lives fourteen. His age may be discovered by his teeth. When young they are white, sharp, and pointed. As he increases in years, they become black, blunt, and unequal. It may likewise be known by the hair, which turns gray on the muzzle, front, and round the eyes. The manner in which the shepherds of the Pyrenees employ their peculiar breed of dogs, which are large, long-haired, of a tawny white color, and a very strong build with a ferocious temper, exhibits a vivid instance of the trust they repose in the courage and fidelity of these animals and of the virtues by which they merit and reward it. Attended by three or more dogs, the shepherds will take their numerous flocks at early dawn to the part of the mountainside which is destined for their pasture. Having counted them, they descend to follow other occupations, and commit the guardianship of the sheep to the sole watchfulness of the dogs. It has been frequently known that when wolves have approached, the three sentinels would walk round and round the flock gradually compressing them into so small a circle that one dog might with ease overlook and protect them, and that this measure of caution being executed, the remaining two would set forth to engage the enemy, over whom, it is said, they invariably triumph. The following interesting remarks are extracted from Chambers. The educability of the dog's perceptive faculties has been exemplified in a remarkable manner by his acquired knowledge of musical sounds. On some dogs, fine music produces an apparently painful effect, causing them gradually to become restless, to moan piteously, and finally to fly from the spot with every sign of suffering and distress. Others have been seen to sit and listen to music with seeming delight and even go every Sunday to church with some obvious purpose of enjoying the solemn and powerful strains of the organ. Some dogs manifest a keen sense of false notes in music. Mrs. Samuel Carter Hall, at Old Brompton, possesses an Italian greyhound, which screams in apparent agony when a jarring combination of notes is produced, accidentally or intentionally, upon the piano. These opposite and various manifestations show what might be done by education to teach dogs a critical knowledge of sounds. A gentleman of Darmstadt in Germany, as we learn, has taught a poodle dog to detect false notes in music. We give the account of this remarkable instance of educability as it appears in a French newspaper. Mr. S., having acquired a competency by commercial industry, retired from business and devoted himself heart and soul to the cultivation and enjoyment of music. Every member of his little household was by degrees involved more or less in the same occupation, and even the housemaid could in time bear a part in a chorus, or decipher a melody of Schubert. One individual alone in the family seemed to resist this musical entrancement. This was a small spaniel, the sole specimen of the canine race in the mansion. Mr. S. felt the impossibility of instilling the theory of sounds into the head of Poodle, but he firmly resolved to make the animal bear some part or other in the general domestic concert, and by perseverance and the adoption of ingenious means, he attained his object. Every time that a false note escaped, either from the instrument or voice, as often as any blunder of whatever kind was committed by the members of the musical family, and such blunders were sometimes committed intentionally, down came its master's cane on the back of the unfortunate poodle, till she howled and growled again. 
Poodle perceived the meaning of these unkind chastisements, and instead of becoming sulky, showed every disposition to howl on the instant a false note was uttered, without waiting for the formality of a blow. By and by, a mere glance of Mr. S.'s eye was sufficient to make the animal howl to admiration. In the end, Poodle became so thoroughly acquainted with, and attentive to, false notes and other musical barbarisms, that the slightest mistake of the kind was infallibly signalized by a yell from her, forming the most expressive commentary upon the misperformance. When extended trials were made of the animal's acquirements, they were never found to fail, and Poodle became, what she still is, the most famous, impartial, and conscientious connoisseur in the duchy of Hesse. But, as may be imagined, her musical appreciation is entirely negative. If you sing with expression and play with ability, she will remain cold and impassable. But let your execution exhibit the slightest defect, and you will have her instantly showing her teeth, whisking her tail, yelping, barking, growling. At the present time, there is not a concert or an opera at Darnstadt to which Mr. S. and his wonderful dog are not invited, or, at least, the dog. The voice of the prima donna, the instruments of the band, whether violin, clarionet, hautbois, or bugle, all of them must execute their parts in perfect harmony. Otherwise, Poodle looks at its master, erects its ears, shows its grinders, and howls outright. Old or new pieces, known or unknown to the dog, produce on it the same effect. It must not be supposed that the discrimination of the creature is confined to the mere execution of musical compositions. Whatever may have been the case at the outset of its training, its present and perfected intelligence extends even to the secrets of composition. Thus, if a vicious modulation or a false relation of parts occur in a piece of music, the animal shows symptoms of uneasy hesitation, and if they ever be continued, will infallibly give the grand condemnatory howl. In short, Poodle is the terror of all the middling composers of Darnstadt, and a perfect nightmare to the imagination of all poor singers and players. Sometimes Mr. S. and his friends take a pleasure in annoying the canine critic by emitting all sorts of discordant sounds from instrument and voice. On such occasions the creature loses all self-command, its eyes shoot forth fiery flashes, and long and frightful howls respond to the immelodious concert of the mischievous bipeds. But the latter must be careful not to go too far, for when the dog's patience is tried to excess, it becomes altogether wild, and flies fiercely at the tormentors, and their instruments. This dog's case is a very curious one, and the attendant phenomena not very easy of explanation. From the animal's power of discerning the correctness of musical composition as well as of execution, one would be inclined to imagine that Mr. S., in training his dog, had only called into play faculties existing but latent before, and that dogs have in them the natural germs of a fine musical ear. This seems more likely to be the case than that the animal's perfect musical taste was wholly an acquirement resulting from the training. However this may be, the Darnstadt dog is certainly a marvellous creature, and we are surprised that in these exhibiting times its powers have not been displayed on a wider stage. The operatic establishments of London and Paris might be greatly the better, perhaps, for a visit from the critical poodle. It is now settled as a philosophical question that the instruction communicated to dogs, as well as various other animals, has an hereditary effect on the progeny. If a dog be taught to perform certain feats, the young of that dog will be much easier initiated to the same feats than other dogs. Thus, the existing races of English pointers are greatly more accomplished in their required duties than the original race of Spanish pointers. Dogs of the St. Bernard variety inherit the faculty of tracking footsteps in the snow. A gentleman of our acquaintance, and of scientific acquirements, obtained some years ago a pup which had been produced in London by a female of the celebrated St. Bernard breed. The young animal was brought to Scotland, where it was never observed to give any particular tokens of a power of tracking footsteps until winter, when the ground became covered with snow. It then showed the most active inclination to follow footsteps, 
and so great was its power in doing so under these circumstances that when its master had crossed a field in the most curvilinear way and caused other persons to cross his path in all directions it nevertheless followed his course with the greatest precision here was a perfect revival of the habit of its alpine fathers with a degree of specialty as to external conditions at which it seems to us we cannot sufficiently wonder such are some of the qualities of dogs in a state of domestication and let me hope that the anecdotes related of them will tend to ensure for them that love and gratitude to which their own fine disposition and noble character give them a claim from us it is pleasing to observe that men of the highest acquirements and most elevated minds have bestowed their sincere attachment upon their favorite canine companions for kindness to animals is perhaps as strong an indication of the possession of generous sentiments as any that can be adduced the late lord grenville a distinguished statesman an elegant scholar and an amiable man affords an illustration of the opinion it is thus that he eloquently makes his favorite zephyr speak captomaculus senioque hebitem morboque gravatum dulcis hire antiquo me qual d'amore foves suave habet et carum zephyrus tuos et leviore se sentit mortis conditione premi interiere quidem tibi quae placuis solebant et forme dotes et facile ingenium deficiunct sensus tremulae scintiolula vite vix micat in cinerem max abitura brevem sola manet vetuli tibi nec despecta ministri mens grata ipsaque in morte memor domini hanc tu igitur pro blanditius molique lepore et prompta ad nutus sedulitate tuos pro saltu cursuque levi lusuque protervo hanc nostri extremum pignus amoris habe jamque vale elisiae subeo loco leeta piorumque dat persephone manibus esse canum in the previous pages I have endeavored to give my readers some idea of the general character of the dog, and I will now proceed to illustrate it more fully by anecdotes peculiar to different breeds. These animals will then be found to deserve the encomiums bestowed upon them by Buffon, as possessing such an ardor of sentiment with fidelity and constancy in their affection that neither ambition, interest, nor desire of revenge can corrupt them and that they have no fear but that of displeasing. They are, in fact, all zeal, ardor, and obedience. More inclined to remember benefits than injuries, more docile and tractable than any other animal, the dog is not only instructed, but conforms himself to the manners, movements, and habits to those who govern him. He is always eager to obey his master, and will defend his property at the risk of his own life. Pope says, that history is more full of examples of fidelity in the dog than in friends and lord byron characterizes him as in life the firmest friend the first to welcome foremost to defend whose honest heart is still his master's own who labors fights lives breathes for him alone and truly indeed may he be called the rich man's guardian and the poor man's friend end of introduction part four